we were discussing jitter generation and one of the sources of jitter in a CDR is the phase noise of the VCO. So, we wanted to find out the nature of the phase noise in a VCO ok and to do that what we did was to consider a ring oscillator uh, with noise and without noise. Without noise of course, it gives you a periodic waveform uh, that is a rising edge. We assume that somehow initially there is a rising edge that triggers a falling edge some time later and the falling edge triggers a rising edge uh, the same time later and so on. So, the whole thing repeats you have a periodic signal. Now, in case of a noisy oscillator what happens is that <coughs> the amount of delay offered by the delay line in the ring oscillator changes with noise ok and that amount is independent in each half period ok. The amount of delay is independent in each half period, but what happens is that the first edge creates a second edge uh, that edge comes sometime uh, which is different from that in the ideal case depending on the noise. <coughs> now, the second edge creates the third edge ok. So, the total amount of delay for the third edge is the sum of uh, uh, the total amount of delay uh, the jitter in the uh, delay in the third edge is the jitter in the delay in the first edge plus the noise added for the second half period. So, there is an accumulation of error right in each half period what is supposed to be half period changes by some amount that amount itself is independent in each half period. But if you look at a certain number of edges later, the amount of error there is the sum of errors in all the previous half periods. So, there is an accumulation of error ok. <coughs> so, if we assume that this is the noiseless case and we start the noisy case like this and it may be like this here like that there and like that there something like that ok. So, this difference is I think what we called uh, this is tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 and so on ok. and the nominal half period is T d the delay of the delay chain ok. Then the actual half period the kth half period will be T d plus we saw that depending on whether the slope is positive or negative a positive noise will either advance the edge or delay the edge ok. this is the slope of the waveform. I assume that it is the same for rising and falling this is not necessarily the case and that has some implications, but like I said we are only looking for the qualitative nature of the phase noise ok. And nominally the kth edge comes at k times T d when I say kth edge it includes both rising and falling edges ok and the actual kth edge it is not at k times T d, but it is k T d plus some tau k right. Now, this is basically the phase noise, but in this case it is expressed in units of time but uh, tau k times 2 pi divided by T s where T s is the oscillation period. This is the phase noise in radians 
okay. You can express this in seconds or radians, it does not matter. Uh, typically, it is common to express the when you say phase noise, you express the noise in terms of phase in radians, okay. It is just a scaled version of this TK. Now, what is this exactly? So, imagine a noisy oscillator, noiseless oscillator, the first edge of the two are identical, somehow they are synchronized. After that, what happens is if you look at the two edges, they will be at different times, right. And uh, so, as you go over time, the noisy oscillator will have a larger variance because each edge keeps moving, right. It is like adding a number of uh, independent random variables. So, each edge keeps moving. So, what happens is something like this. If the noiseless oscillator is like that, the noisy oscillator will be the first edge by definition is uh, synchronized and the next edge will be different and the next one could be different and so on. <coughs> okay. And each half period, the change in each half period is independent of each other. So, what happens is if you look at the difference between these two, right. Now, of course, it is a random quantity. So, let us say you make a million of these noisy oscillators and compare it to one noiseless oscillator. These million oscillators will all have different edge timings compared to the noisy one, right. But uh, they will have some statistics that we can determine, okay. So, the first one will be off by some amount and you can plot the Gaussian distribution for that. The second one will be off by slightly larger amount, right, because it includes the movement of the first one and the second one. The third one will be off by even bigger. So, if you look at uh, after a large number of edges, the variance will be quite a lot, okay. You understand this? So, let us say you have a 10 gigahertz oscillator the and you start with the first edge synchronized. The first edge may be off by only let us say 0.1 picoseconds, okay. Then uh, when I say 0.1 picoseconds, that is the sigma of the distribution. Then the fourth edge will be uh, basically it will have uh, twice as much sigma and the sixteenth one will have four times as much sigma and so on, okay. So, it is like adding independent random variables. You know that when you add independent random variables, the variances add up, right. So, if you have <coughs> so, let us say x k r what are known as i i d you may be familiar with this term independent identically distributed random variables. In our case each half period is uh, the width of each half period is an independent identically distributed random variable. So, if x k is i i d so let us say it is a Gaussian with uh, standard deviation of sigma and if y is a sum of n of those things what will be the sigma of y? What is it? Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, what is it? I mean, I said all these x's are identical and independent. Yeah. So, basically, the variance of x is sigma square, each one is sigma square. So, the variance of n of them added together is n times sigma square. So, the standard deviation is square root 10 times sigma okay so similarly if you look at the what is known as absolute jitter what is absolute jitter i think i defined this earlier it's basically the timing of each edge compared to an ideal periodic clock okay and you assume that the very first edge is synchronized okay And we will say that first edge is synchronized. So, as you go further and further, uh, it will keep drifting away more and more, okay. And this is not difficult to imagine. Let us say you imagine a watch which gains like a few seconds uh, regularly every day, and that happens to be independent in each day. So, then you can, uh, if you run this watch for a year who knows at the end of the, I mean although it loses maybe only a second in a day, at the end of the year it will be off by minutes right probably or at 
place like many seconds ok, because every day there is a cumulative error. Uh, so, if you take a large number of these watches they will all be different from each other and the amount of uh, variance keeps on growing with time ok. So, if you plot the variance of the absolute jitter in this case basically this is nothing but sigma square of T k, T k is the absolute jitter right and I will plot it versus k which is the kth period alternatively you can do it as k times uh, uh, T d in absolute time ok, it is the same. So, if I call this 0 at edge as the synchronized edge then by definition uh, that is 0 right and then after that it increases linearly with time and the increase in each uh, T d this is T d 2 T d 3 T d and so on and this increase basically equals the variance of each half period ok. The noise of a VCO in fact does look like this if you happen to have a uh, an ideal oscillator and a real VCO and you compare the edges of the two, the two must be at the same frequency of course and you compare the edges of the two as time goes by they will drift further and further apart ok. This is fine. No, no that is correct. So, this is refers to the variance of the drift right meaning uh, you make a large number of oscillators ok at every edge you measure how much the difference is between the ideal oscillator and each one of them ok and the difference will be different for each oscillator. Some of them it may be close to 0, some of them it will be far away and so on right and then uh, as time goes by in each half period they will accumulate either positive or negative ok. But uh, what happens is because you are accumulating errors the variance will go on increasing with time you understand. So, it is not that uh, each oscillator has to have like a positive error accumulating this way, but uh, you have a distribution of oscillators and as time goes by the distribution gets wider and wider I mean the distribution of the edge timing ok. So, it is true for some oscillators it may be that uh, the first one is positive second one is negative and in fact over time the uh, total timing is very close to the ideal one but the likelihood of that is small. In fact, you can find out because it is a Gaussian distribution you know the probability density function ok. But uh, as time goes by like many of them uh, have errors adding in the same direction it does not have to be same in every cycle, but over basically the variance will grow because you are adding so many errors uh, over time it will uh, the likelihood that it will uh, drift apart from the ideal periodic clock will grow that is all ok. So, after so let us say you look at the first edge the distribution will be like this ok and it will have some sigma. Now, let us say that ok maybe this is a 1 gigahertz oscillator and the sigma happens to be 1 picosecond right. So, that means that you measure a large number of oscillators you plot the distribution of uh, the change from the ideal periodic oscillator basically the width of each uh, half period that will be that will have a standard deviation of 1 picosecond. Now, you look at the 100 edge what will happen is the distribution will look like that and it will have a sigma of 10 picoseconds ok. There will be for sure cases uh, where the error is very small ok, but there will be like many more cases where the error is quite large that is all ok. So, that is the meaning of the sigma right. So, basically the point is I mean if you look at it after the first edge you could say maybe with some reasonable guarantee that uh, you will be within plus minus 3 picoseconds of what it should be right the timing of the first edge is within plus minus 3 picoseconds. I am say taking 3 sigma as an adequately accurate example it also depends on how much confidence you want to have in your decision, but 
you cannot do the same for uh, let us say uh, after the 100 threads right, because plus minus 3 picoseconds there is some significant stuff after that. Okay. So, you just cannot guarantee that they will be within that, okay. there will be for sure some cases within that and then many cases also outside that. right? Is okay. Again, I would uh, say that you think of a watch which uh, accumulates a certain error each day, and the error accumulated each day is independent of the previous day. That's probably a reasonable assumption. That the clock has some errors. So you now imagine two cases: one where you reset, reset your clock, like before you go to bed every day, versus one which you leave alone. So after 100 days, the other one, the one you which you do not reset it is likely to be far apart. It is by possible that by coincidence it is close, but if you have a large number of watches you cannot guarantee that it will be uh, close to uh, reality right, I mean close to the correct timing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is possible, but it does not mean that the period reduces to 0. Okay, meaning it will still have 10 edges. First of all, you have to, I mean, not within 10 edges, basically. So, each period is slightly wider or uh, smaller. Okay, so that means that after 10 edges, it can be quite a bit away from 10 times 1 nanosecond, right. So, the, by the way, this is 1 gigahertz oscillator, so the period is 1 nanosecond. So, what happens is that, so this period is 1 nanosecond. Okay. So, now let us say you look at it after 1 million cycles, right, 1 million edges because again like uh, each edge is a half period, right. So, this uh, period is 1 nanosecond, half period is 0.5 nanosecond. Okay. So, let us say after you look at it after 1 million half periods, which means uh, how much is that? Point 0.5 millisecond, okay. or rather you look at it after 1 million half periods, ideally it should be 0 0.5 millisecond. Right? So, if you measure uh, 1 million half periods of a 1 gigahertz oscillator, ideally it should be half a millisecond. Now, what it says is if you have 1 million half a periods, what is the sigma? Uh, 10? 1 nanosecond, sigma is 1 nanosecond, it is basically 1000 times 1 picosecond, right? It is the square root of n times 1 picosecond. So, the sigma is 1 nanosecond. What does that mean? Basically, the ideal one will complete its uh, 1 million half periods in 0.5 millisecond. Okay. The actual one will complete it in slightly less or more than half a millisecond and it may be off by as much as 1 nanosecond or even more. Okay. It is true, but do not think of it as some edge that is disappearing. Each period is off by a small amount like it accumulates over a large number of cycles and if you wait for a sufficiently long time, I mean just like you have let us say a bad watch and then you wait for maybe a century, it may be off by a day, who knows. Okay. It may be off by, I mean it is supposed to be periodic with one day or half a day and then it may be off by a complete day, that is it. So, if somebody is in jail like using this watch to count the number of days he is in jail, maybe he is off by one day, I mean, it may not be a big deal, but uh, <laughs> if you are in jail for 100 years. but. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that can happen, okay. but it does not mean that somehow the day is missing, right. it still completes that many days, it is just that its timing and the actual day uh, night timing is off by some, okay. it is the cumulative effect, it is not as though this edge goes and jumps off into the next edge. Remember in this case the edges are, the edge timing is correlated, okay, because all the previous ones get added up, it is how, that is how it goes to a very large error. If it was white, and if the variance was so large, then yeah, you can say that hey, this edge has gone beyond the next edge. But that's not the case here, okay? Because the the uh, sigma of each half period is expected to be much smaller than the half period itself. 
okay it's not that the half period ever disappears or something right but if you accumulate enough of them the total timing of that just like you let a watch run for like 100 years and it could lose a day in fact you don't need to run for 100 years many watches like few years it may lose a day who knows right that's possible okay any questions about this so the variance just accumulates with time right because you essentially have something with no reference yeah, the oscillator doesn't have any other periodic reference right it generates its own timing and its timing is an error and you run it for longer and longer time so the accuracy with which it measures the absolute time will be different and that error only grows with time okay those of you who are interested in the timing in fact which must be all of you because you're in this course there used to be this uh, longitude problem have you heard of this so basically the question is how do you measure uh, longitude when you go on a ship now you have gps and all that to tell you the position but let's say in the 18th century or 17th century latitude is okay i mean by position of stars and so on you can find out but longitude it is symmetric right with the earth so you can't tell so one was of course to make uh, very detailed star charts and then try to do something with it the other one was let's say you have uh, uh, you can tell the local time though by looking at where the sun is okay so you have a clock which is let's say you start from some port maybe mumbai or something and then you have a clock which is synchronized to mumbai time so and it has to be dead on accurate and then you are going and then you know you can find the midday and by looking at the time difference you can tell what the longitude is okay and there is actually a book uh, whose title is uh, i think longitude uh, so that's actually a book about how to how somebody tried to make like very very accurate clocks but this is in uh, uh, i think 18th century or maybe even earlier using all wooden instruments and this guy made uh, there was some guy some clock maker called john harrison who made astoundingly accurate clocks it's actually very difficult to keep a clock accurate on a ship because there's a lot of vibration and swaying and things like that okay so this guy figured out all kinds of engineering tricks and remember this is a time when all this uh, periodic motion was not described by differential equations to figure out where the errors are there is no impulse sensitivity function no phase noise formulation all this stuff but uh, i mean uh, that accuracy is so good that i mean many of the modern clocks that you buy also probably are not that accurate so today it's very easy to keep accuracy accurate clocks with crystal oscillators and resynchronization and so on but it's actually a very nice book to read so this guy actually made clocks which uh, some of would be immune to vibration of the ship because these are all pendulum clocks right if you are a swaying i mean the whole thing is based on gravity so if the ship is moving this way and that way and this thing will drip like anything but so but some of this guy managed to make like very nice clocks the nice book also to read it's pretty short <coughs> so anyway timing i think has been general obsession for a long time i mean not just now so to keep accurate timing so anyway, i hope you get the idea behind this so you always imagine these cases you have a noiseless oscillator noisy oscillator with the same frequency so say otherwise of course it will drift apart anyway but even with that because of noise each edge will be different and how much each edge will be drift different will drift with time so for that you have to imagine the ensemble average where you have a large number of oscillators and you imagine the distribution of it the distribution will get wider and wider that is all these different oscillators will uh, have different edge timings and how much they are different by expands with time like this in fact it goes up linearly with time if you have white noise this is actually a well known result okay and if you look at uh, the jitter in disjointed periods that is if you look at jitter in this half period and the next half period and next half period they are all uncorrelated with each other okay 
Similarly, if you look at the jitter in this period and this period and that period, they are also uncorrelated with each other. Okay. Is this clear? So, the jitter in different periods will be uncorrelated with each other. So, the period jitter is actually white. Okay. So, again if you look at uh, you do the same experiment, you have uh, the ideal periodic clock and noisy clock and you will measure the distance, measure the actual time of each period for different periods, they will all be uncorrelated with each other and they will have some distribution. Okay. This is fine. You can take either half or any period jitter. Basically, if you take disjoint segments of that, they will all be uncorrelated with each other because the noise added in each part is uncorrelated with each other. this is actually white this is okay now to find the spectrum of absolute jitter we saw that basically it like this because if V n is white, okay. So, essentially If you think of this as a discrete time process, the difference equation it follows is tau times 1 minus z inverse equals okay. Essentially, what it is saying is you have V n prime by s, which is white going through an integrator 1 by 1 minus z inverse. Did I use the same notation last time? Yeah. To give you tau. Okay. So, again we are not doing this to find all the scaling factors correctly, but only to find the spectral density of phase noise. Okay. this is the relationship between the white noise that affects each half period and uh, the absolute jitter. So, how do you find the spectral density of absolute jitter? If you have a filter, you have some input white noise and then the output there is some other noise, how do you find the spectral density of the output noise? You have to multiply the input the spectral density by the magnitude squared of uh, the filter's transfer function to get it. Okay. So, S tau of f equals S v of f, which we consider constant with frequency and okay, I think this is a bad choice of notation. Hopefully, I would not change it. This S is the slope okay. 1 by S square times the magnitude square root of this and z you know is exponential j 2 pi f divided by the sampling rate, the rate at which this discrete time process is sampled. Okay. 
and in this particular case now each of this is basically the uh, sampled every half period right so the sampling rate is two times the oscillation frequency okay where f not is the oscillation frequency again whether it's 2f not or f not we could have taken uh, we could have kind of ignored every half period and taken only the periods the result will be the same so what do we get here the magnitude square of this and i think you know this this is a pretty common expression right what's the magnitude square here so basically this whole thing becomes j2 sin phi f by 2f not times some complex number basically this is exponential minus j phi f by 2f not right the magnitude square of this the magnitude of this is 1 and j of course is 1 so it's basically this part of it okay this is the spectral density of tau basically the deviation of the edges in uh, seconds okay and also we are usually interested in this for uh, f much less than f not okay that is for a 10 gigahertz oscillator we are looking at basically uh, the spectral density at frequencies much smaller than uh, 10 gigahertz okay essentially in our case for instance our uh, Cloak and data recovery's bandwidth is going to be a few megahertz or a few tens of megahertz. We are interested in it up to maybe a few times that. Okay, not all the way there. So we don't have to worry about the sample nature of this and so on. So we just look at what is happening at low frequencies. So what is the approximation used at low frequencies? Yeah, sine x equals x, right? So this becomes S V of f one by s square. So basically, I just square the argument. Okay. Yes. This one, S V of F. That is the spectral density of. Uh, yeah. It is a sample process, but I am evaluating the spectral density over continuous frequency. Yeah. So that doesn't change anything, right? So which one? Yeah. So that's why. Uh, S V of F value is not infinite, right? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I think earlier I mentioned that. So, don't think of it as sampled white noise. Then you will get infinity. Okay. You think of it as sampled noise. The sampled noise has white spectral density. That is from zero to fs by two. Okay. Zero to half the sample. Rate. I mean, if you do sample ideal uh, white noise, you will get infinity. Okay. In reality, in this whole process, I mean, I can send you the slides. I'm not going to do it here. For a ring oscillator, it's not that difficult. If you know the basics of a single crossing and a noise, you can actually calculate the basic result by making some model for the delay. It will be some current source charging a capacitor. The current source will have some noise, and because of that, you will get this uh, noise. And in within that, there will be some band limiting. Okay, so it's not infinite bandwidth, but that sample noise will be white. In that, it will be different in each half period. Okay. Yeah. 
square wide means constant P s t. So, from 0 to f naught okay, because this is a sample at 2 f naught right. So, anyway the main thing I want you to pay attention to is this 1 over f square dependence. Okay. Remember this is basically the spectral density of phase or rather uh, by the way uh, the phase deviation is related to the time deviation by that much right 2 pi times the oscillation frequency times tau k is not it. So, this will be a dimensionless number which is the phase. So, if I have to get this what will be the result what should I do I just have to multiply it by the square of this ok. So, So, pay attention only to this part this f square in the denominator right. So, this means that basically the phase noise will have a frequency dependence of 1 by f square it is not white ok and it is the same it is saying the same thing that we saw in the time domain it is correlated for uh, low frequencies meaning long time scales and it is uncorrelated for high frequencies right. The, okay, this uh, spectral density uh, it has a low pass type of uh, shape right it is high value at low frequencies and low value at high frequencies ok. If I plot this on a log scale this is also on a log scale it will be falling at minus 20 dB per decade. Remember it is the spectral density that is falling as 1 over f square it is the same as the voltage falling off as 1 over f. So, it is falling at minus 1 to uh, 20 dB per decade. In fact, typically uh, it is common to club all the other constants into some constant called a and call it a divided by f square ok. And similarly, the sigma square of phi I earlier plotted sigma square of tau, but it is the same thing right with a scaling factor. So, that will increase with time you start with synchronized oscillators, but this will increase with time. Essentially, the two are saying the same thing. Okay. Is it okay? So, there is another way to derive the same result using an LC oscillator, but I thought the cumulative nature is easier to find out from this. So, that is why I chose this. But if you have any difficulties, please think about this and then let me know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is right. So, basically uh, voltage falling off as uh, 1 over f is the same as the power falling off as 1 over f square. Right. Is it ok? <coughs> now, one other thing I will just add as a fact in reality we do not only have uh, white noise we also have 1 over f noise in MOS transistors. Are you all familiar with this 1 over flicker noise basically flicker noise. So, if you have a MOS transistor it is uh, drain current will have a white noise component which in strong inversion saturation is 8 third k t g m. In addition to this it will have some k by f component which will dominate at low frequencies. The reason for this is uh, if you have a MOS transistor it has a capacitor it has the oxide uh, gate 
oxide and the semiconductor interface and the one of the theories is that there are traps charge traps at the semiconductor oxide interface and these traps will uh, trap charges with different time constants that also gives you noise. This is in addition to the thermal noise that you remember the MOS transistor is just like a resistor. So, it will have thermal noise that is the 830 kT gm part. The other part is because of this trapping and detrapping at the interface and that gives you this uh, low frequency noise ok. So, this will also give you a slight modification in the phase noise at low frequencies ok. Now, again I would not go into like how it comes about, but you can guess that this white noise gave you 1 by f square right. this gives you 1 by f square. Similarly, this uh, 1 over f type of noise will give you what 1 by f cube ok. This will be something the frequency dependence will be 1 by f cube, but exactly how flicker noise translates to 1 over f cube phase noise that is more complicated. It is possible to have uh, flicker noise in the transistors, but have no 1 over f cube part in the phase noise. Okay. That is also easy to see here. In fact, in the model that we have chosen, even if you have flicker noise, there will not be 1 by f cube phase noise because of this minus 1 to the k plus 1. Okay. This means that alternate ones are added and subtracted. You understand? This means that we have let us say minus v n of 1 plus v n of 2 minus v n of 3 and so on. That is how we have this, right. Now, if you can imagine that if you have low frequency noise, it will be the same for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on ok. So, they will get cancelled right. So, now what can, uh, so why will the not get cancelled in reality? It could be that the rising and falling slopes are different ok. In this case, I have assumed that the rising slope is the same as the falling slope ok. So, let us say if the rising and falling slopes are different, but the noise added is the same, the amount of time shift in alternate uh, edges will be different. So, there will still be some residual part. So, I would not go into any of those details, but I will just tell you that this uh, 1 over f noise can cause 1 over f cube noise and in fact, frequently it does. It is not possible to completely eliminate it, but with some symmetry and so on, it is possible to reduce that. And importantly, this, uh, this corner here where the 1 over f noise falls below white noise, this is known as what the 1 over f corner frequency of the MOS transistor ok. Similarly, in an oscillator there will be 1 by f cube 1 by f square. The frequency at which 1 by f cube noise falls below 1 over f square noise it is known as 1 by f 1 by f cube the 1 over f cube corner frequency of the oscillator and these two are in general not equal to each other ok. This 1 over f corner and 1 by f cube corner are not equal to each other and because just like uh, I told you now. Uh, it is possible to have 1 over f noise, but no 1 over f cube noise at all if there is perfect symmetry ok. Yeah. No, no what is of high frequency? Here this is the spectral density of phase that means this frequency refers to not the frequency at which you are transmitting this refers to the frequency with which phase is fluctuating ok that is still at a low frequency low meaning I mean it can be hundreds of megahertz, but we are not looking at uh, 10 gigahertz type of stuff ok. This is ok. So, that is like a quick and rough introduction to phase noise. Basically, the important things to remember are that the phase noise of an oscillator has a cumulative behavior ok. That means that if you start uh, two oscillators with uh, synchronized edges, they will drift apart over time with increasing variance ok. And the reason for that is clear because there is no external reference each periods width is changed by noise and each period is changed in an independent way. So, when you add up a number of those things you will have bigger and bigger variance ok. Now, the result is that if you plot the spectral density of this absolute jitter, absolute jitter refers to the timing of each edge compared to the edge of an ideal periodic clock it will have this 1 over f square a component when you have white noise. White noise is fundamental you will always have it. In addition in case of MOS transistor oscillators you will have 1 over f noise in the devices. So, you could have 1 over f cube noise 1 over f cube phase noise in the oscillator ok. Any questions here?
Now, uh, we will quickly look at the one last thing that <coughs> what does phase noise of an oscillator mean? So, let us say I have an ideal oscillator okay, whose waveform is uh, I will think of it as a cosine, but again I have, as I have said it is not the waveform shape that is important. Okay could be any other shape this could just be the fundamental component, but it is easy, easier to manipulate uh, formula with cos. Let us say I have uh, an oscillator whose amplitude is uh, let us say V p and whose frequency is F naught. What is the spectral density of this? What is the spectral density of uh, that signal? It will be an impulse. Okay. What will be the area of the impulse? Yeah. What is it? V p square by two. Okay. If I consider single-sided spectral density, it will be V p square by two. Now, let me consider V p cos two pi f naught t plus phi of t. What is this? This is the phase noise which we just evaluated, right? Phase noise can be from many different things. Like for instance, in a CDR, we saw that you can have output phase noise because of jitter generation, that is internal uh, noise generated in the clock and data recovery circuit. It can be due to input jitter and so on. But now we are considering only the oscillator. Ideally, the oscillator would have given a periodic waveform whose spectral density is an impulse. In reality, it gives you 2 pi f naught t plus phi of t, which is phase noise. What will be the spectral density of that? What do you expect it to be? Clearly, this is not exactly periodic. Okay, so it turns out that it'll have that shape. Okay, and what will be the area of this? It will still be V p square by two because the power of this is also V p square by 2. Okay. It is just that instead of all the power being concentrated at a single frequency f naught, it gets spread out in frequency. Okay. Now, how do you find out uh, how much spread out it is? You can do that by expanding this. This is V p cos 2 pi f naught t cos phi of t minus V p sin 2 pi f naught t sin phi of t. Okay. And this can be approximated by because this phi is expected to be small, this is after all phase noise, right. So, we assume that this is small. So, this is approximately V p cos 2 pi f naught t, which is the original signal we wanted minus this again phi is small. So, I will take it as V p times phi of t times sin 2 pi f naught t. Note that I mean this kind of approximation can give you errors, because this says that it is the ideal impulse plus something that is not the reality, but we can use this approximation where uh, for basically when f minus f naught is sufficiently large that is in this region we can use the approximation. We cannot use it here clearly, because here it is telling you that it is an impulse plus this that is not what is the case. Okay. You can only use it away from f naught okay. and what is this telling you? Basically, it says that it is V p times phi which is modulated to f naught. Okay. So, we already know s phi. So, we can calculate V p square times uh, S phi that will be the spectral density that you see. Okay. So, essentially if you plot this versus F minus F naught, okay, if you plot this shaded part here what I have shown versus F minus F naught essentially that is what you will see. You understand? Okay. So, you can continue from this you can think about it, but because we are saying that this looks like the ideal part plus this 
but I am also telling you that this is not valid exactly at f equals f naught, but a little bit away from that when the spectral density becomes small. So, if I plot the same uh, spectral density of a real oscillator versus f minus f naught, essentially I will see these what are known as skirts. Okay, These are known as phase noise skirts that is what I would see and if I plot that on a log log scale basically that is the phase noise. Okay. So, if you plug an ideal oscillator into a spectrum analyzer of course, we do not have an ideal oscillator you should see an impulse. Okay. If you plug a real oscillator into a spectrum analyzer you will see this type of shape which is spread out okay. and the narrower it is the closer it is to an ideal oscillator. What is the in this case narrower means that in the log log scale uh, the spectral density would have been like that right okay which if i do it on this scale it should be like that it becomes closer to an impulse i mean don't compare the height of the impulse with this the height of the impulse doesn't mean anything it is just an indication of uh, that it's an impulse the height is infinity right so if the phase noise becomes smaller and smaller you will have i'll assume that all of them have the same amplitude vp so the area under all of them is vp square by 2 but it will get concentrated in a smaller and smaller range of frequencies. Okay. Ultimately, if you have an ideal oscillator, it will be concentrated at a single frequency and it becomes an impulse. Okay. So, now if in this region that is far away from F naught, if you plot phase noise, a better oscillator will have lower phase noise. It makes sense, right? It has smaller fluctuations. Is this okay? So, again. Uh, as I have said before, this phase is a sort of abstract quantity. You do not see phase directly. You eventually plot the uh, spectral density of uh, the voltage. I mean, that is what you measure in a spectrum analyzer or you have to do phase detection and measure it, but you have to be able to connect the two. This is the connection, right. So, if you have an oscillator with phase noise, it means that the spectrum instead of being an impulse will be spread out. The larger the phase noise, the more spread out it will be. Okay. That means that instead of all the energy being concentrated at a single frequency, it will get more and more spread out. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. No, the wave shape only determines the harmonics. Okay. So instead of uh, so an LC, maybe it produces, let's say, VP cos. 2 pi f naught t and what does a ring oscillator produce? Maybe it produces an ideal square wave. So, let us say you know this right, this is the sign of cos 2 pi f naught t. So, this means that it is either plus or minus 1, but you know that this is basically V p right, it is just the Fourier expansion of this. Is this okay? I mean let me not do this. It is an ideal symmetric square wave, this is n s odd. Okay. Now, with phase noise, what is it? This is V p cos 2 pi f naught t plus phi of t, and this will be this plus phi of t. What will happen? Every harmonic of this will have 2 pi n f naught t plus n phi of t. Okay. So, ideally this will produce a single impulse at f naught, this will produce impulses at f naught 3 f naught 5 f naught and so on and with noise at f naught this will be spread out the output of the LC oscillator. Here you will have components at f naught 3 f naught 5 f naught and so on all of them will be spread out okay. and in fact the amount of spread is also proportional to n. Okay. So, that is what it is. So, the fact that you have harmonics does not matter for this discussion. So, it only says that if you look at the component at f naught, it will get spread out by this much. Okay. If you look at the component at 3 f naught, it will have 3 times 5. Is this fine? 